Welcome to episode 101 of the Fitness Simplified Podcast. I'm your host, Kim Schlag. On today's episode, I am joined by Dr. Brittany Mathteller. You might know her as Doc Brit Fit on Instagram. Britt is an exercise scientist, a health and fitness coach, and a mom. She is passionate about promoting physical activity, particularly resistance training in children and adolescents and in moms. Her online business focuses largely on promoting uh, evidence-based fitness education and helping moms navigate pregnancy and postpartum fitness. Our discussion today largely focuses on physical activity, but with how we as parents can help our children be more active and on our activity itself. We focus, we discuss activity trackers and what their role is in our, um, in our health and fitness. Let's go. Britt, thanks so much for being here on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to have this conversation with you. So you're coming to me from your parents' attic. I am. We are in Pennsylvania visiting family and I've got a crying baby and dogs barking and this was the quietest place I could find. So amazing. So <laughs> Pennsylvania, that's my neck of the woods. Where do you usually live right now? I live in Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Okay. And how long yeah. have you been there? Um, for seven years. So I moved there in 2014 to do my PhD. I did my PhD at UMass Amherst. So, um, and you're yeah, heading so back this way to Pennsylvania. I am. We're we are moving back here this summer. So that's so exciting. Are you excited to be home? Oh yeah, super excited yeah. to be closer to family and friends. Um, I don't know if other yeah. states have such a thing, but when when I saw your stories the other day, and I'm like, wait, you're from Pennsylvania? What part? And then I, you didn't even have to answer me because I saw you talking about going to Sheets, and I'm like, I know yeah. it's not my part. We have this like rivalry, this competition between like the best convenience store in our state. Is that yeah. weird? I don't know if people listening are like, yes, our state does that too, but well, there's Sheets and there's Wawa. Yep. yep. <laughs> and I honestly, I love both, but I don't, we don't have Wawa's. So I can't even really. You can't even do it. Right. Depend on that. Yeah. yeah. We, I'm solidly Wawa country, but like 45, 50 minutes away, you could go to a Sheets. So yeah, I'm team Wawa. Cause that's where I grew up. And I just have yeah. like this, you know. So I don't know. You guys have to write me and tell me, is this a thing in other states? Do convenience stores compete for your affection? Yeah. Let me know. <laughs> Dying to yeah. know. So, so if funny. you don't know who Britt is, and uh, um, you should definitely be following her on Instagram. I have really been enjoying your content for quite a while now. I've been wanting to have you on. Her handle is at DocBritFit. And that doc is because Brittany is a, has a PhD. She is Dr. Brittany. I want to say your name. I should have asked you before. Mass Teller. Yes. Mass <laughs> That's good. Did yeah. you wrote it out for me? And I'm thinking, I think I get it phonetically. Mass yeah. So tell us about your PhD. Like, what did you study? What was your research? Sure. So uh, I went to UMass Amherst to study uh, physical activity in, in specifically children and adolescents. So uh, at UMass, I worked in the physical activity and health lab, which kind of spanned a few different interests. We did a lot of physical activity measurement. Uh, we also did physical activity interventions, uh, and then I kind of combined the two of those and did a physical activity intervention in children and adolescents. So my work really, my dissertation specifically really focused on intervening in younger children. I studied third and fourth graders to expose them to different types of physical activity. So I did a non-traditional, I guess, physical activity intervention a lot of the time these interventions are more moderate to vigorous physical activity based in the sense that they're more traditional activities like walking or stuff that kids doesn't, don't really like. Mm -hmm. um, so I did a resistance training intervention, actually. It was set up like a typical, what you would see in like a circuit class as a group fitness. If you took group fitness as an adult, it was similar to that. I had battle ropes. I had BOSU balls, medicine balls, uh, had like some balloon stuff where they practice balance and coordination, uh, like fun things for them to do. And they basically completed a circuit as part of their physical education course. Mm -hmm. uh, and in addition to that, they had a before school portion where another day a week they would come before school and do the same thing. So it was about like a 15 minute circuit. Um, and I was, I was, looking to see if that improved not only physical activity, but if it improved their self-efficacy to perform physical activity, if it improved their confidence, attitudes surrounding physical activity, uh, and things like that as well. And, and what did you find? Did it improve those things? 
Uh, yes, and so, some more than others. So uh, unfortunately, we didn't see a lot of statistical significance in um, the measures that I took, but there's a lot of reasons that I could uh, speculate as to why. I think it is important though, what I did do was I, I collected regular data with numbers and you know I had the more physical activity monitors, they took surveys and whatnot. But what I also did was interview the kids so after they were finished the intervention, I asked them about it. And I think that was really where I had some really rich data because I had some really great conversations with them where, I mean, you know, kids, especially third and fourth graders, they're not, <laughs> they're not always um, the best at communicating in the sense of a survey or something that is very uh, rigid. So giving them the opportunity to just express themselves and talk about whatever they want and guiding them a little bit with questions was just awesome. And, you know, a lot of them expressed that they really enjoyed doing uh, activities that were more than traditional sports. So, which is really my reason for, for doing that. Uh, you know, growing up, I wasn't really interested in traditional sports, but I became, I came to love exercise and physical activity. And I thought that growing up, because I didn't play sports that, you know, I, I wasn't good at sports, that I wasn't able to be fit in the way that I wanted. And I think that is something that a lot of adults struggle with. Uh, even if they did play sports as a kid, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. eventually you stop playing sports, most people. Yeah. Um, so teaching kids how to exercise in a way that makes them feel strong and confident. That's what they were saying. You know, I felt so good about doing this. And, you know, the first week it was really hard, but then by the end, I felt like I could be really good at it or I could do more things like that, you know? Yeah. Um, and it was just so awesome to see. I know that like my actual data didn't really point to there being a significant change in anything, but I only did it for 12 weeks for one. Mm-hmm. Um, and the verbal feedback that I was getting from them was like all that I needed to show to like, okay, we can continue doing things like this and researching it further and address some of the confounders that are maybe, you know, affecting the data because okay. clearly it's working on some level. Um, even if the Do numbers you see it as a problem, there. I see it as a problem, just observing, you know, having had kids, I have three kids. They're all a little bit older now. My youngest is 15 this, the sports culture that we're in, in America right now, particularly you start young and you have to pick a sport and specialize and you have to do a lot of it because if you are not good, you don't have a chance to play, or maybe you have a chance to play, but you really kind of have aged out because you don't feel good enough to start a sport in middle school. I know one of my kids for actually several of my kids felt like, so they didn't feel good enough to start a sport in middle school. They were years behind. I see this as a problem for encouraging activity in our kids in their preteens and teens. Absolutely. It's a huge problem. And I mean, there are areas of research that study this specifically, this hyper specialization and overtraining at very young ages leads to burnout. It leads to negative associations with physical activity and exercise in general, because it feels less fun and more like a chore, which at, you know, in kids, we especially don't want to see that, you know, um, and it leads to all that happening sooner. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, there's a lot of levels to this. I think obviously parents play a role in this, coaches play a role in this, and the kids are just kind of absorbing what their environment is. So a combination of all of those things. So yeah, I definitely see it as a problem. And I think that it's getting worse, actually, mm -hmm. because it's more competitive to play. Not only, you know, you're talking about middle school, and that's not even like up to the collegiate level, which is really like in high school is when these students are really trying to, you know, make a name for themselves so they can get recruited to a college if they, if they want to play in college, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, it's so much stress on them. And I've seen it every year I do not this past year because COVID, but every year I do a, um, like health and nutrition lecture for this group of uh, high school lacrosse players who or no, field hockey players, sorry, that come to UMass for like a weekend tournament thing where they, it's like a camp, right? Mm -hmm. And every year I give this lecture to them about nutrition and overall health. These are like 14, 15, 16 year old girls. And the amount of stress that they place on themselves, even at that age to eat and eat to perform a certain way mm -hmm. it is just it's really hard and for me I would focus a lot on like 
you know, fueling for your performance as an athlete and making sure that you're not, you know, restricting yourself too much. And like, you need to be eating a lot of food so that you can fuel these really long practices and all these tournaments that are hours and hours long or span a whole weekend. Um, and just kind of teach them how to feel appropriately rather than putting pressure on them to eat a certain way, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's really tricky because this is when we see, we know that this is when a lot of you know, eating disorder behaviors can start or worsen because mm-hmm. of this, you know, high pressure to succeed at sports specifically. It's, it's really tricky. And I think you're right. It definitely, it's definitely a problem. I have seen in my adult clients, this has played out. They come to me and they say, well, you know, my poor relationship with food and with my body started when I was in gymnastics and I was in 10, when my dance teacher said X to me when I was 11, um, Mm -hmm. you know, this kind of stuff, it, it plays out for many, many years. Um, and we end up with a lot of adults, uh, who struggle with their body image and have abused food for years, um, kind of as a result of this. So for the parents listening, what is, what do you think that they can do? What are positive steps they can do one to help their kids be active? If maybe they're not confident in sports and if like, they're just not sure what to say, if they want their kids to be active, but you know, not all kids really want to be like, I don't Mm want a mom. There's a lot of that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I work with a lot of adults in like in my coaching aspect of my work. And I know like I work with kids in the research aspect. And one thing I can say is I really think that addressing adults addressing their own relationship with their body image and with food and exercise is one of the most important things you could probably do. And I know it sounds like, I know people probably hear that all the time, like, oh, invest in your health for the well-being of your family. But like, no, that's, it's really like the research shows that that's one of the most powerful predictors of physical activity and health in their, in children is, uh, their parents and their environmental influences, including their family members. And I think that it is, you know, it's tricky and it's difficult, but I think as an adult, if you have any lingering issues, like what you're describing, how you have clients who this goes back from the time they were very young And they're probably addressing it now thinking, holy cow, like, I feel like I had blinders on to a lot of this whole part of my life. Like, I never knew that I could feel this strong by lifting weights because I never tried it because I was never exposed to it. And I just didn't know. So I think on the flip side of that, exposing kids to more things to be physically active, letting them try multiple, you know, different types of activities. And maybe it's not traditional sports, you know, maybe it's not your baseball, softball, soccer, you know, the traditional ball sports, I guess, Mm -hmm. is what comes to mind. But a lot of kids just don't, they aren't interested in that. um, Or they don't feel like they're very good at it, which there are things we can do to address that as well. But from the sense of they just don't seem that interested, let them try Mm -hmm. other things, you know, and and until you find something that's maybe better suited for them, I think as kids get older, the more you can explain to them why, but I think when they're younger and they don't really have the cognitive ability to understand like long-term health, they just want to have fun. So if that means going to a trampoline park for a few hours on a Saturday or like doing things like that, where it's activity, your heart is racing, you're sweating, like that, that's all movement, but kids don't want to go to a, not all kids, okay, some might go to a gym and do, you know, three sets of 10 resistance training types of exercise. I'll, you know, like I said, some might, like, I probably would have liked that as a kid, but I think it know. depends on how we frame it. So my kids, some yeah. of them have shown interest and they've all shown interest at different times. Um, mm. Our local Y, a good, gosh, a good handful of years back changed the age you could start bringing your kids. And so you could start bringing them like at 10. And so like you would bring, I would bring my kiddos and they thought it was pretty cool that they had to meet with a trainer and show them the machines. And then they would, they would be interested to see like, what is this? And they felt very grown up that they're allowed to be in there. So I think it kind of depends on the yeah. kid and the situation, you know, and it's I totally have a gym does. in my house. And one of the things, because I did grow up as a person who was not good at sports. I, you know, then stopped pretty all kinds of those kinds of activities for a large chunk of my life really struggled with my weight. And so as I was getting myself back in gear, it became very important for me to model to my kids 
mm-hmm. this is what we do to be healthy and we like it. Like I like yes, it. Right. I, I find it, enjoyment yeah. in this and I find satisfaction in this. And so I like when they come down and they're just talking to me in the gym and like one of them would, they'd be like pedaling backwards on the elliptical while I'm lifting. And I would, you know, say things and it's true. It wasn't like I was making stuff up, but I would be like, I love how exciting it is. Like, did you just see that? Like I lifted more and I'll be like, Hey, to my daughter, like feel my bicep, you know, like these kinds of things Mm -hmm. that like I'm really proud about. I want to model for them that I find enjoyment and satisfaction in getting better at this and just doing it. Not that it has anything to do with how I look, not that it has anything to do with burning calories, but just like, I like this stuff. Mm -hmm. Totally. And that's a huge part of it. Like to genuinely have that relationship with exercise and to be able to model that for your family and for your children is an an amazing positive influence. And, you know, I think probably as parents, sometimes we want to not force, but like, we really want our kids to be healthy, right? We want them to be happy and live like really great lives and all these things. But like you're saying, they, they all kind of are going to come to it at their own time. So I think not pushing it so much that they become resentful, which is, is what I think happens a lot of times with sports and, you know, a kid clearly is becoming disinterested as they get a little bit older and maybe they're even really good at it, but they're just like, this is too much work. This isn't even fun for me anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do it. And sometimes what we see is that drop off. So that usually happens around like 10 to 12. It's a little bit earlier for girls and it's just declines. Physical activity just drops off in adolescence real badly. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's a huge decline. And a lot of times we really struggle to get it back up ever again in a whole lifetime. Yeah. So I would love to see it, you know, obviously the decline get a little bit less steep, but also like, let's figure out why, like, let's get them introduced to different activities that are beyond traditional physical activity. Cause I mean, I think about PE when I was in middle school and high school, and it was a stereotypical, like girls hated PE and it, it's just terrible. <laughs> so the whole model needs to change, right? But it's it's just a long process to get there. And unfortunately, mm-hmm. at the school level is just one facet of this. But mm-hmm. really at home is where, you know, the lifelong learning is going to happen. So if you're a parent listening to this, and it's something that's really important to you to instill in your kids, make sure that you have it within yourself first, mm-hmm. you know, and really work on that. And beyond that, you know, beyond modeling it for them, when they see you genuinely enjoying physical activity and exercising and, you know, look how strong my muscles are, look all these, like, look at this giant bag of dog food I can carry around the grocery store without being tired. Like those sorts of things. Kids see that they're observant. They know, like they, they can see how you are reacting to, to that. So. And on the flip side, they can pick up on you saying things like I have to exercise, like I, you know, or like, I have to, like, I just ate pizza. I have to go out and run. Like they can, they can start making oh, yeah. like, oh, I have to exercise to eat pizza. And mm-hmm. like, I have to exercise. This is something I don't want to do. This is something I'm going to have to do. So I think it's important yes. to like check. Look, that's not good for us to be having those thoughts anyway, but it's certainly not going to help our kids um, to develop a positive relationship with exercise. Right, right. And, you know, incorporate them when you can. Like you're saying, like, if you, you know, not, if I know, understand that not everyone has like goes to a gym necessarily, but even at home or if you're mm-hmm. going for a walk or like a run, have them like yeah. race, like, like little things like that really add up. And Absolutely. It like it's going so... on a family walk instead of like watching yeah. a TV show. And, yeah. and I try to make these things enjoy, but I genuinely like hiking and I like kayaking and these things. And so when I have my kids come with me, I try not to make him super duper long. Like I'm not going to take my daughter on a four hour hike. She's not going to be super thrilled with me. Right. But I can right. take her on a shorter hike and try and make it as pleasant as possible. Or also like, Hey, let's go for a walk. And then we'll go to target because she's a teenage mm-hmm. girl. And she likes target. Right. And so yeah. we'll go yeah. for this walk and then we'll go to target. Right. So I kind of like yeah. get some buy in there, you know, yeah. and then family vacations, frankly, like I look to plan family vacations with an eye to like, what can we do? That's Mm -hmm. going to be physical. We're getting ready to go on a trip. Like I planned a family reunion at Zion and then we're going to head to Arches. Like, so we're going to be doing some hiking. We're also going to hang out by the pool and stuff. So I'm not going to make it all like move, move, move. But I think it's important to like find ways to make it fun. And also how can you not like hiking when you're in a place like that, right? So there's going to be cool stuff 
that she doesn't, she's not used to seeing. So yeah, no, that's, it, that, those are all really great examples. Thinking outside think, of balls, I guess. Is, yeah. <laughs> is the, yeah. And if for each family, it's going to be a little bit different, right? Depending on like where you live, depending on your schedules, depending on how many kids you have and how old they are, like this is going to change and morph. But I think the consistent thing is like, you're trying. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that that can go a really long way, especially, you know, if you're, if you're later in life learning these things about your own fitness journey and your own relationship with exercise, I think it can kind of feel like you're playing, playing catch up sometimes like, Oh, I spent so much of my life, like not caring about this. So I need to make up for it. Mm -hmm. But I just caution parents with that, especially because kids are still kids. So they don't know that they only know you now, like they don't know the mistakes that you've made. Like they don't know that. So to, to them, you have a blank slate of opportunities to introduce yeah. this to them. So absolutely. Yeah. Now, when you were talking about the statistics about um, kids dropping out of activity as they hit, um, you know, kind of that preteen age, mm-hmm. are the statistics the same for boys and girls? Do they drop off differently? The the decline for girls is worse. It is. That's what I would yeah. assume. I just wasn't sure if the numbers back that up. It yeah, makes sense to me thinking about like yeah. body image and, you know, I don't want people yep. watching me and I don't want like how my body looks doing this. And that. I remember we had a pool at my high school. I have no idea why I did not go to a fancy high school, ladies and gentlemen. I do not know why, <laughs> why we had this amazing swimming pool. And so we had to swim in high school. I hated that. Like mm-hmm. it upset me like that. First of all, you had to swim. So you had to put a bathing suit on, but then you had to walk around the rest of the day with like your wet hair and all this stuff. Like, it was oh, terrible, yeah. it was terrible yeah. to me. It felt like pure torture. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I know my daughter doesn't love doing gym class at school. So it doesn't shock yeah. me that numbers are something else we need to work on as a society, like how to help these girls to not to feel more comfortable in their bodies so that they can feel mm-hmm. comfortable moving. Yeah. It's really sad. And we see the gender differences in physical activity from the time kids are, you know, 18 months old. Like we can see that trend just continues. 18 that, months old? That girls are less active wow. than boys. And a lot of it, I went to this really interesting presentation once and she was talking all about this and she hurt. She studies a lot of gender differences in physical activity and she was describing why this happens and how like some of our just like social conditioning lends itself to this, like girls wearing dresses and shoes that they can't run around in and telling them that they can't get dirty. And on the flip side, we have like, oh, boys will be boys. Boys are allowed to be loud. And they're like literally wearing it on their clothes, right? They've got these clothes that say things about like being dirty and stuff. Yeah. Isn't it? And and when she, once she, once I went to that presentation and just like listened to these things that she was pointing out, I'm like, I just can't unsee it now. (laughs) And um, I think, you know, over time that just continues and we see that, you know, once puberty happens and or starts to happen and adolescence occurs, not only are we having kids like burnt out a little bit from participating in so much activity, you know, maybe overtraining and all these things, but now we have this added layer of puberty and body image issues and pressure from society. And, you know, it's just, it becomes a whole tangled yeah. mess. So there's a lot I to think, work on there. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, I think, I think we do have a lot to work on, but I do think it's getting better. I think that, you know, physical education in general is changing a lot. And we do see more now we have, you know, weightlifting types of things in PE class or opportunities to be more, be active in different ways, or like you have multiple options of being active, but I still think that it always is the default that like girls do the easier, less forceful activity. Like in my PE class, it was walking. They were always like, you can walk if you want. (laughs) And it was just all the girls were walking and all the boys were playing the whatever. Yes, I totally, I see that same thing with my daughter talking about like there, they had choices. We could do this activity in middle school or we could just walk and she would just walk and they did it a lot. And frankly, I was glad that they were moving at all, but it was interesting that that was the only thing that they felt comfortable doing from all this whole, and it would be like multiple different tries to like, oh, do you want to go play badminton or do you want to walk? We want to walk. Do you want to play soccer? Do you want to walk? And so, you know, finding something that they wanted to do more than just walk would be, would be useful. Now tell me, what are the physical activity guidelines for youth? 
I don't have so, those memorized. Yeah. So the physical activity guidelines for youth are, you know, a little bit beyond what they are for adults, actually. So they recommend that kids are active 60 minutes, moderate to vigorous physical activity, 60 minutes a day, every day, um, which children are not meeting physical activity guidelines either. I think that it's assumed that children are active, especially younger children. It's just assumed that they're active or that they will, they don't need guidance or direction to be active as much because they're kids, quote unquote. Yeah. And that's just not true. <laughs> that's a myth that like will not die, especially in today's day and age when we have TV, we have tablets, we have these things that prevent physical activity in our environment. We have essentially engineered physical activity out of the environment for a lot of families. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But the notion that you just get physical activity, your kids will just be active because their kids is not true. true. Um, and I think that is a really surprising uh, realization for some people, uh, especially when they have kids of their own and you ask them to, you know, okay, well, let's observe your kids for a few days. Do you think they're meeting the physical activity guidelines? And a lot of times if they're in, you know, a, a, a daycare program or a preschool program or something, that might be a little bit different depending on, you know, what their schedule looks like. Mm -hmm. But I, I, a lot of parents tend to underestimate their child's eating behaviors and physical activity. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, more activity is better, obviously. And there are little ways, like we were saying earlier, of just like getting it in. It doesn't have to be 60 continuous minutes, right? Especially with kids. We're talking about like maybe five to 10 minutes at a time yeah. Um, before they get bored and want to do something different. Uh -huh. But this can look a variety of different ways. You know, it's not like a structured exercise program all the time. It might be if there's like a video that they like to watch and like dance along with it, or if there's a playground, they'd like to go jump on the monkey bars. Um, you know, kids are supposed to participate in muscle strengthening activities that is beyond traditional resistance training, although that can be an option for some kids who can do it safely. Mm -hmm. um, like what I was describing with the circuit training, like kids can do battle ropes, they can get their heart rate up. Mm -hmm. um, they really like it. They love feeling good at something like that. They love exerting energy by, you know, smacking battle ropes or throwing a medicine ball. If you have, if you have the equipment like that at home or you have access to it and your child is uh, like mature enough to be able to handle it appropriately, mm -hmm. go for it. There's nothing that's going to, you know, from a physiological standpoint, there's nothing unsafe about that. As long as the load's appropriate, you know, we're not, we're not going to toss a 50 pound medicine ball on a 30 pound mm -hmm. kid, right? As long as the load's yeah. appropriate and someone's monitoring them. Um, that's totally fine. And, you know, I think we should encourage it if, if they're interested and you have the access to it, why not? Yeah. Um, there are also coaches who specialize in resistance training or conditioning types of activities for children. I'm glad um, we're talking about this because this is a myth that I know persists that, that kids should not be strength training yeah. at all because yeah. they are, you know, damaging their growth plates or whatever, yeah. whatever the thing is that people say. Yeah. That's a very common myth too. And that won't die. <laughs> yes. It and it just like, oh, I always hear that still. And, you know, I think, you know, when you look at the actual data of injuries from resistance training and all the position stands, the most recent position stand where it talks mm -hmm. about resistance training and, and youth and those injuries, most of them come from injuries related to being in a weight room, like plates dropping on fingers or toes. Mm -hmm or something like that, like mismanagement of equipment, which ultimately comes down to lack of like pro lack of proper guidance and instruction, right? So right. not the actual weightlifting itself, but the environment of, you know, being around weight plates and dumbbells and things mm -hmm. and not being instructed on how to safely unrack them and rack them back and, you know, proper behavior in a weight room. If you're, you know, a younger boy and you're all they're pushing each other, and, you know, <laughs> you know how it can get really crazy when you, you have a group of kids, that's where those injuries come from. It is not from growth plates, you know, sealing shut too early and all of these things, but I understand the concern with that. Yeah. Um, it's just simply not true. Yeah. Now you are a mom. How old is it's Benji, yeah. right? Benji is 17 months old. So I have, I have a, a wee little one, a little teeny one. How <laughs> yeah. has all of this knowledge, like what impact does this have on you and how you plan on interacting with him as far as movement? 
you know, it's really, I've really had to evaluate what my relationship is with exercise now versus what it was prior to having him, because I think my expectations continually shift. And I, I, suspect that that will continue to happen throughout his lifetime, depending on what stage we are in as a family, right? I think I've had to work out at home a lot, for example, and like, I don't have a full home gym. I have some dumbbells and obviously Mm -hmm. for for most of his life, it has been the pandemic. So that has definitely (laughs) been like, that's what he knows. (laughs) Yeah. So I think, you know, for me, like managing my expectations around fitness has been really, um, important. And I think that's good though, to model for him. I know he probably can't tell now, but you know, as he gets older, he will see that, you know, mom prioritizes this, even if it's just 30 minutes, it makes her happy. She's moving her body. And, you know, even if it's just a ride, a bike ride, or we run with him in his stroller a lot, um, things like that. So I've, I've had to include him a lot because I've been home with him most of the time, the last 17 months. Mm-hmm. Um, which I just, I never liked working out at home. <laughs> so it's just, it's just been interesting. Cause I think I had really high expectations and then I've had to just continually reevaluate them. Like on a, on a daily basis of what I want from physical activity for my life and for my family, you know, and it's been good for me because I've had to address, you know, some of these things that come up I think when we have kids and what we don't want to pass on to them and reflecting on the inside about okay well what does that mean for us or what it, what does that mean you know so it's been a, been a lot of reflection but ultimately I think really really good and because I know how important mine and my partner's relationship with physical activity is going to be for Benji that makes me prioritize it even more mm-hmm. you know and that doesn't necessarily mean working out like a fanatic for multiple hours every day or anything. No, that just means that I prioritize it and it's important to me. So I make time for it. Um, and that's really easy to give up when you're a parent, I'm realizing because it's busy. <laughs> Absolutely. The time crunch is real. It mm-hmm. is, it's incredible how much time children take up. You have no idea mm-hmm. before you've had a kid. Like no. just and watch- I only have one. So I can imagine yeah. as you add kids like that, <laughs> yeah. again, continually shifting. <laughs> the biggest change really is going from zero to one. And then one to two is kind of crazy too. After that, it just doesn't really matter all that much. Yeah. <laughs> By the time that. you've got two, you're just like, whatever, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I only ever had three, but really that change from zero to one. It's like, wow, my whole life is like, yeah. what an it's upheaval. A, yeah. It's folding more in is always easier. Um, yeah. Well, let's turn our attention from talking about our kids to talking about us as grownups here. Mm-hmm. What do you think the role is? Like, We all love our activity trackers, right? Everyone mm-hmm. is kind of obsessed with these. What do you think about the proper role of activity trackers? What is it? So I think it depends on the person. For one, I, I personally see activity trackers as a cool tool that you can use to help elicit some sort of positive behavior change. I think where people go wrong is where they obsess over it and obsess over the numbers and forget that it's not going to be entirely accurate. There is nothing in the world that can capture every complexity about you as a human. So for something like, let's say a step goal. So I have a lot of people who I know in my own life, just like friends, family, et cetera, who have very sedentary jobs and they really like using an activity tracker of some sort to track their steps because if it gives them a good goal because they don't even, they never even realize like how little they move throughout the day. And they'll say things like, I work out every day, but like, I can't seem to insert goal here that they're like not, they're missing some sort of um, factor when they calculate their energy expenditure, right? And they realize that it's because they're not moving during the day. They might move for an hour to work out and the rest of the day they're sitting. We call these um, weekend warriors or mm-hmm. that's what they're referred to in the literature as um, where you're can be really active during the day and then sedentary the rest of the day. So for something like that, where you're trying to, you know, take a five minute break every hour or something like that, or you're trying to meet a certain step goal across a day so that you're just moving more, you know? I think that that can be appropriate for many people. I think it can become unhealthy to the extent that people are 
maybe chasing a goal that's unrealistic for them. Like you can't go from doing 200 steps to doing 20,000 steps a day and expect to be totally consistent in that. Like you got to work up to it at some point. Um, so I think, you know, sometimes that can be a little bit tricky, but I do think the, the goal of moving more is a good goal for most people. That's what they need. They need to be moving a little bit more. So why not? For sure. I think, you know, they're pretty decent at tracking steps, especially with activities like walking, but where people get tripped up is like a weightlifting session, for example. Uh, it's not a cyclical movement, like uh, walking is very, you know, it's the same. Um, so activity trackers have a hard time at picking that up, especially if you're wearing it on your wrist and there's no sort of like heart rate strap and it's estimating, let's say caloric expenditure. People get really tripped up on caloric expenditure on like their activity trackers and everything. And I caution people to, I, I pretty much never have anyone do that unless it's for the purpose of they want to, you know, compare across sessions. Like if they do a similar type of workout every day, mm-hmm. they had a client once who she liked doing group fitness and she went like four times a week and she would just like to see the average of her day. So when she had a day that was like really different, she just wanted to know that it was different than all the other days. And she could tell, cause she's like, Oh, normally I'm usually within this range and I'm like way less than that or not. Mm-hmm. And I, I just wasn't feeling that great. It's just data, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think it, it, something like that is just way too complex to get from a watch. Even, even if you input your height and your weight and all of those things, there's still going to be things that it just cannot take into consideration. So I, I somebody like out there them. right now is thinking, but I have an Apple watch. I have the yeah. fancy one. I know that's yeah. what they're thinking. We're talking to you too. <laughs> yeah, we're talking to you too. And you know, it's not to say that they're useless because they can be really great for some activities. They're really accurate, right? But for a lot of the things that we do, like, and I'm sure a lot of people listen to this, they probably like to wait, do weightlifting in some capacity. They like maybe group fitness to some capacity, like we're at some type of circuit training that's not a rhythmic movement. They're just not as good at picking movement up with that type of movement. So it's not, it's not worth getting worked up over. And when we study these in the lab, what we see is, you know, we'll, we'll compare basically how they do it is they take a visual, uh, the GoPro or something, and they'll watch the person do the activity. And they're also wearing, sometimes they're wearing a, uh, an Oxycon mobile device, which is a device that measures your uh, breath coming in and going out. So this is one of the most accurate ways you can measure caloric expenditure in a lab setting, right? So they're basically mimicking a free living activity but it's still in a tightly controlled setting. So some of these activity trackers are validated to that type of movement pattern. But again, when you take them from that tightly controlled thing, and then people are using them in the real world, Mm -hmm. there's going to be some degree of mismatch there. And not to mention these activity trackers are constantly getting updated and revamped so that the equations that they use to determine all of these things are constantly changing, (laughs) constantly changing. So even if something does get tested in the lab and they, you know, refine it, it changes again. So it's really just not worth tripping up on the actual individual data points for most things. Now there, there are most, there are steps. I think, you know, that can be great. I think, you know, some people like to use them for tracking something like sleep, Mm -hmm. which uh, it depends on the activity tracker if it's more or less accurate for that. Um, I, I think a lot of them just measure body position is how they measure. Mm-hmm. So they know they have accelerometers in them that know if you're sitting, standing or lying. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And some of them are better than that than others. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, I, I think if you're a data person who really just likes tracking your data and, you know, you take your body weight every day and you take you know, how many hours of sleep and how many steps you got. All this. Those are all great things to track for your health, like, or they can be for many people. Um, but look at the big picture of things rather than the five calories that you're confused about yes. why you didn't burn. Yes. Yeah. 
I love, I love that perspective. So you're getting ready to start a new exciting adventure career wise, right? So you run Dr. Yes, Fit and you're getting ready to take on a position with Orange Theory Fitness. Tell us about that. I am. Yeah. So I start next week. Um, I am hired as a research scientist for Orange Theory Fitness, which for those of you who aren't familiar is a global fitness franchise um, with locations all over the world. So I'm really excited about that. Um, they have some really exciting research collaborations coming up that I'll be assisting with um, and you know, helping with science communication within their membership, which is awesome and always something that I'm really passionate about. That's I do that a lot on Instagram yeah. and with my own clients. So just having that opportunity to do that on such a large scale is just so exciting to me. I'm really looking forward to the potential, you know, just for impact and to help debunk some of these things for, for a lot of people, you know, these are the questions that people ask about health and fitness. Um, you might sometimes think like, this is probably a stupid question. I get people that say that to me all the time. And to be honest, it's one, it's not. And probably there are a lot of other people with that same question. Absolutely. And if I can easily answer it, you know, that's a win. That's someone that does, you know, whoever had that question too, they're no longer wondering what the answer is. And I think that that is so powerful, especially when we're trying to make sure that people have the tools to be healthy and fit and reach their goals, whatever those goals might be. So yeah. I'm what do you think is the role you know, considering you're going to be working for orange theory fitness? What do you think is the role of group fitness, um, in an overall fitness program for an individual? Yeah. So I think one thing that happens with group fitness is it gets, uh, overused and maybe abused a little bit when it comes to fitting in a, a whole fitness program. I think that, you know, for many people, they get their start in group exercise. And there's a lot of reasons why that can be beneficial. I've taught group exercise for many years and, I like it because you do get some instruction from qualified coaches. So your group fitness instructors are typically trained specifically in group fitness. Uh, usually they have another certification as well. So if you're someone who is maybe new to fitness, but doesn't can't afford a one-on-one -on -one personal trainer, um, or maybe the thought of that just intimidates you because it's like one person looking at one person, which is a lot of people who are new to fitness. I think a group fitness environment can, can, provide a really supportive environment to just begin that. Mm -hmm. And what I see a lot of times is once people get really comfortable and they, if they like it and they are like, okay, I, I can do this. Like I can exercise. This is awesome. I love this. They want more. They want to see like how they can do better and what the next thing is, which a lot of times leads to a more individualized program. So I typically recommend group fitness as a supplement or as one mode of fitness fitness or exercise that you participate in, but not the only mode of fitness, mm. that, ideally, right? Yeah. Obviously, some exercise is better than none. I would never say it wasn't. But if you're looking for really specific body composition changes, for example, or strength goals or whatever, I still recommend two to three days of resistance training. So as in, you know, prescribed sets and rest and sufficient, you know, time in between movements yeah. rather than a circuit training type of activity where your heart rate is up the whole time. Um, and I think a lot of people don't realize that that's where the magic happens is kind of a balance between both. Cause we still want your heart rate to be up sometimes because we want that cardiovascular endurance to build. But if you're trying to get stronger, you're going to have to rest a little bit more. And if, if you want to increase your weight, you have to rest a little bit more and you have to have a program that's going to allow you to do that. And group finish just isn't the place mm -hmm. for that type of goal. So I do think, you know, it has a place in the fitness industry. I think that it can be a really important introduction to fitness for a lot of people. And, you know, not just those who are new to exercise necessarily, but those who maybe are lonely and yeah. group fitness is a way for them to connect with people who also enjoy exercise. You know, I think mm -hmm. about moms, I think about older individuals who, mm -hmm. you know, have are lonely and that is yeah. where they talk to people. <laughs> yeah. Having that sense of community and people who enjoy yeah. doing the same thing and just people in general, gosh, these days, we all know how important that is, exactly, right? <laughs> just seeing some people. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I love, I love your summarization of that. Just the idea that it is a tool, right. And we have mm -hmm. to make sure that the tool we're using is right for the job and that we're using all yes. the tools that we need for, for the goals that we have. That's fantastic. Yes. So the other big thing I know you have coming up is I want to make sure is it brains vibrate or brains with yes. brains, brains vibrate. 
Tell us about that. I love this. I think this is fantastic. Yeah. So once I started in the online space, I, I realized that there was kind of a gap between, you know, some, a lot of people find fitness or find a passion for exercise like later in life. And I don't mean like way later. Sometimes it's not later, but it's late enough that like maybe you already went to college and you graduated and you wished you always took an exercise science class or you're going back to become a personal trainer. And you're like, man, I really wish you take, would have taken a like course in this in college because I find it so interesting. So that's what I did. I created a, it's similar to what I would say an introductory exercise science course. I've taught a course like this several times at a university level right now, until I start my position at Orange Theory, I am a part-time professor. So I do teach exercise science courses and I've taught a course similar to this um, many times, I think four times. So I was like, you know, this is kind of what is missing. I think that a lot of people would enjoy learning the science behind like the, the actual science of exercise and then be able to apply it to, you know, if they're want to become a personal trainer or if they're scrolling online because they follow a bunch of accounts online, but they keep falling for this misinformation because it sounds good, which is what I see all the time. I always mm-hmm. see because people don't know some of the, the basics, they, they fall for some of this misinformation that's targeting essentially people like them because mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. they're counting that on people not knowing. <laughs> essentially. Yeah. Um, so I created this course. It has seven modules that cover, you know, seven main areas of exercise science. And I changed it this time. So now it's, it's going to be a self-paced course, uh, an all online course of text and videos for me explaining different um, areas of exercise science, exercise physiology, public health research, and kind of just how to navigate it all as a consumer. And for some as a trainer or how to use this as a coach. Um, and I think that, you know, it's needed to be honest, because I don't, I, I, I just see this so much of, you know, people wanting more information, but not knowing how to get it. And they don't have the money or the time to take a traditional college class now. Mm-hmm. Um, cause college classes are expensive. You have a very rigid schedule. Um, you have homework and all of these things. Yeah. So I wanted to provide an option that was a little bit different. So that's what create, that's why I created brains by brick. Um, I love this. So ladies who are listening, you know, if you're here and you love exercise and you want to know, like, you really want to understand it, this is, this is for you. I think it's fantastic. And especially, you know, coaches, I remember as a new coach thinking like, after I was done my certification, I was like, that's it. Like, that's what you're you're, you're going to teach me. Like most of what I feel like what I know was like self-taught after that. It was not Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. I remember being stunned really that that it was over. I was just like, like we're just getting started. So I think this is great for that. So if you're a new trainer or somebody who's pursuing that, I think this is fantastic for that. Yeah. And I, I, I totally agree. And I think in the first round of this that I offered in January, it was a similar sentiment from newer coaches or coaches who are planning on becoming certified soon. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the most valuable parts of the course is access to me. So they loved asking me questions and, you know, me elaborating on things. I think when you're studying for a PT exam, a lot of the time, like you're studying and then you take the test and that's it. You don't really get a chance to sometimes be like, Oh, I, I wonder about this. And you don't have anyone to ask. Absolutely. So, Fantastic. I am, I'm who you can ask if you're interested in that. Um, the course opens May 24th. So Fantastic. Tell everybody where they can find you. Let's end with that. Yeah, they can find me at on Instagram is where I hang out the most at Doc Brit Fit, D-O-C-B-R-I-T-T-F-I-T. Um, and all, the, all of my links to my programs and my website is in my Instagram. Amazing. Thank you so much for being here and having this conversation today and taking time away from your kiddo while you're visiting your parents. It's, that was really generous of you. Thank you so much. Oh yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of the Fitness Simplified Podcast. I hope you found it educational, motivational, inspirational, all kinds of ational. 
If you did enjoy this episode, if you found value in it, I would love it. It would mean the world to me if you left a rating and review wherever you are listening to this podcast. That really does help it get in front of more people. And if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to the channel and give it a like. Again, this stuff really does matter. It helps for my stuff to get in front of more people and help more people. Thanks so much for being here. I will see you next time.